Good morning to everyone. It takes a little bit to climb out behind all that equipment, but I made it. <laughs> I'm sure everybody's going, what's going on? Where is he? Somewhere. <laughs> okay. I, kind of, I have a question for you because I'm going to be doing something a little different today. Um, have you, at work or with your coworkers or somewhere else or even family. And they ask you a question. And that question is, why are you keeping Jewish holidays? This has happened to me before, met several times where I work, but they're good in understanding people. And how I answer them is, it's in Deuteronomy, I do believe, where I said, and the Lord said to Moses, these are my appointed times. So what would you call that? That's basically what we call a remiss, which I'll be going into. And there are times I will get questions on, why do you keep the Sabbath? Why do you do that? So how do I answer them back? It says, and the Lord rested on the seventh day and made it holy. That again is a remiss. And that's basically what I'm going to be dealing with today. And Hopefully I do it right. Because I have a definition for remez. Okay. I have, I've lightened some areas to kind of give a difference. But I'll read it. It says, the great teachers, rabbis, during Jesus' day used a technique that was later called remez. In their teaching, they would use part of a scripture passage in a discussion. If their audience knowledge of the scriptures would allow them to deduce for themselves the fuller meaning of the teaching. Jesus, who possessed a brilliant understanding of scripture and strong teaching skills, used this method often. So that's when we ask that question again. There are times I know you're in conversations with people and what will you do? you'll use part of a scripture. You don't have to tell them chapter, verse, and all this kind of stuff. You'll make a mention of it. By doing that, by taking a partial of a scripture and repeating it to them, it's a remez. Now, I have an example of a remez, which I'll read to you. It says, When the children shouted Hosanna to him in the temple, and the chief priest and teacher of law became indignant. And you'll find that in Matthew 21, 15. So does that not raise a question? Why did they get indignant? There's a very strong reason for this, because as we continue, it says, Jesus responded by quoting Psalms 8-2. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. The religious anger at Jesus can be better understood when they realize that the next phrase of Psalms 8-2 revealed why children and infants offer praise because the enemies of God would be silenced. Jesus was implying they were God's enemy. So do you see how he was using that remez there? He was condemning them through Psalms 8, 2. So it kind of answers a question, you know, about, okay, why are they getting all worked up? Well, now you kind of know on how he was using this method of teaching. We do too. You'd be surprised if you stop and think for a minute. When you're talking to people, you do the very thing. Now, even amongst ourselves, we have discussions and so forth, and we will use those phrases of Scripture, not realizing that we are using a remez. Because we understand and know amongst ourselves, we do understand Scripture. Because you have to realize back in Christ's day, they didn't have Bibles like we do. You know, where you can go to the corner store, you can buy a Bible. The only time they came in contact with Scripture was in the synagogue. So they learn by phrases. 
And that's how it, they were taught. It was very common. Now what I would like to do is I'm going to be reading the Law of the Witness. What I'd like you all to do is just kind of get it in your mind. Because I'm going to be using it when we go to John 8. The law where it says, you must not convict anyone of a crime on the testimony of only one witness. The facts of the case must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Is that not common in our legal system? That when you're in a court proceeding, they don't listen to one witness. They have to have at least two. That's based on law. So here we just so kind of keep this law of witness in the back of your mind. And then it goes, if a malicious witness, one that is spiteful, that's some sort of issue with you, I'm going to cause some trouble for you. You know, I have seen this. Uh, in my job, there's part of it goes with code enforcement, and uh, we will have neighbors. A neighbor making a false, false claim against their neighbor to get code enforcement myself on the property to investigate. Nine times out of ten, what do we discover? It's an argument between the two. That is a malicious witness. So we deal with that like we're supposed to. A lot of times we just say, sorry, and we just walk away from it because we know what it is. But if there's an actual problem, then we will judge that. And then in 19, it says, the judges must investigate the case thoroughly. If the accuser has brought false charges against his fellow Israelite, I'm sorry, did I read 17? Because that is an important one. I didn't. It said, then both the accuser and the accused must appear before the Lord by coming to the priest and judges in office at that time. That one I want you to really remember as we go further. It said the judges must investigate the case thoroughly. If the accuser has brought false charges against his fellow Israelite, you, this is, <laughs> I'd love this one, because this is one that strikes fear in people. It says, you must impose on the accuser the sentence he intended for the other person. In this way, you will purge such evil from among you. Now think about that for a minute. Back in this time, if you were accusing someone of murder, it turned out to be a lie, and then the judges are going to look at you, and what are they going to do? They're going to be sentenced to death. So that's how serious this was taken, this false witnesses. As a matter of fact, I believe it's one of the commandments. You shall not bear false witness. It's a serious matter. Now, I don't know in our law, I don't know, it's changed so much, you know, with perjury and things like this. Yeah, there is a, a penalty for that, but it's not like this one. With, where this one where it says, you accuse this person of this, this is what will be sentenced on you. I don't think we're, we're there. And then going on to Jeremiah 17, verses 9 through 10 says, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? I think this is something we understand. It's just something we're subjected to because of a decision was, was made by Adam and Eve that brought us under the influence of our enemy, the one who has the influence over this world, that... That is something that we fight. When we made that commitment to God, when we received his Holy Spirit, where did the war begin? It began in your mind. 
because what you normally accepted, all of a sudden you're realizing that's not true. It's the wrong way. Because I look at myself, because I was a young man, 23, when I came into God's church. But prior to that, my philosophy was, do no harm to anyone. Don't, well, I won't say break the law. But I don't get caught, then I'm okay. Those were accepted standards in my mind at that time. But what happened when I was baptized and received the Holy Spirit? I realized your thinking is wrong. You may think it's right, because does it not say to man there's a way that seems right that ultimately leads to death? What did I just do there? A remiss. Okay, but then it goes on and says, But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. What is those two words? Secret motives. Any of us guilty of that? Of course. I've had secret motives. So some of them not good. Some of them sorta. But it came down to basically, I wanted to get ahead in my career. So what was the secret motive? If I can undermine the person that's standing in my way, then so be it. That's a secret motive. But there's many, it has many faces. But these are the things that God sees. And he wants us to see when we evaluate ourselves. Are we practicing secret motives? Because if we are, we need to deal with it. We need to get past it. Okay, now we're going to begin in John 8, 3. This has to do with the adulteress in Christ. There's, this said a lot to me, because I'm going to tell you what kind of inspired it. Uh, we had a tragedy at work, where I work. Uh, a co-worker that I have known and worked with for 10 years, a man that I know well, he took his life. Uh, it, he hit it well, and uh, he was a family man, three adult children. He was a uh, pillar in their church. Y y we just didn't know, but it was something that took us all by surprise, especially me because I spent a lot of time with him. The department I work in and his department, we were constantly working together. So I knew the man well. Uh, it was sad. But the thought that actually came to my mind that I'm still kind of dealing with, um, I don't know, because I know in the past that religious institutions have said, you take your life, you're condemned. I never really questioned that until that came this close to me. And that's when, you know, the story of the of Christ and the adulteress just kind of moved into my mind. It's saying, Jeff, pay attention to this. Think about it. But let's go through it. So it begins. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, now, I have to ask you a question here. Is there something wrong with this? Is something not taking place according to the law? Exactly. And that's the ones, if someone shouted out in there, let me get there. If someone shouted out, hey, wait a minute, you're supposed to appear before the Lord and the priest, and the judges. And the judges will make those determinations. Why aren't you doing it? 
Something's not right there, is it? Yeah, it's kind of disturbing because if you look at Leviticus 10, verse 20, I do believe. No, yeah, 20, verse 10. What does it say when it comes to adultery? Both the man and the woman will be put to death. Where is he? There's something that stinks about this. There's something that is wrong. And then when we continue in verse 4 and 5, it says, They said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? I go, you know, this circumvention of, of their law, that's where I go back to that thing where I just said, they are be, supposed to be taken before the Lord, the priest and the judge. Why isn't this happening? It's, yes, it's disturbing to me. But they looked at Christ and said, but what do you say? But I'm going to ask the question there. Is Christ a priest? Is he a judge in this instant? Sure about that? But what does the law say? Now Christ was God's son. He was God in the flesh. He was a messenger. He was not part of the priesthood. Nor was he a judge. But as he dealt with the public, he was. But what I'm trying to say is the legal things of the law here is they are supposed to be taken into the temple, put before the priests and the judges. Why are they coming to Christ? We have an answer to that. It says, this they say, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. What does that have to do with the crime of that woman? Absolutely nothing. And most people may look up and say, this was a setup. They set this woman up. Where's the man? Why are they before Christ? Why are they not in the temple before the priests and judges? Your answer is right there. Testing him. That they might have something of which to accuse him. Is that not a secret motive? Isn't that what's at play there? You know, it goes back to the accuser. If you're a false witness, that sentence that would have been done to that woman will be you. You will stand in her place and it will be your life. You see this game that they're playing here? It's a very dangerous game. But they may say, well, wait a minute. We were already there. The judges found her guilty. Well, then why are you bringing him to, her to Christ? Why aren't you taking her outside of town and stoning her to death? You have a secret motive. This woman may not be guilty at all. But we'll get to that. Now, we don't really know. It says, but Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Oh, he heard him. We don't know what he actually wrote. You know, we can only assume. And I have done this in Jeremiah 17, 13. And if you read that chapter, it's about Israel's sins and the th things that they were doing. He says, you are a spring of water giving Israel life and hope. But if the people reject what you have told me, and this was God that was talking to Jeremiah about their sins and how he was storm and so forth. I firmly believe, that's me, that the intent there was they will be swept away like birds written in dust. How do we know? We, of course we don't. Was Christ writing their names in the dirt? I believe he was giving them a very 
clear warning that if you pursue this, because Christ knew their heart, your names here would be swept away like dust, which means you're dead. You are dead. Your life, your name will be written, taken out of the book of life. I agree. It's an assumption. But it's kind of falling in line with, with things. And then continuing, he said, they kept on asking Jesus about the woman. And he finally, he stood up and said, if any of you have never sinned, then go ahead and throw the first stone. <clears throat> you know, they're there. <clears throat> you look at them. These guys, the, the, these scribes, and people, they're ready to murder this woman. You know, you look at their motive. How do you know this woman is guilty? You're ready to kill her so you can blame it on Christ. You could bring some legal action against him to put him to death. For doing what? Putting himself above the law. That's what the crime would be. Blasphemy. See, it, it, it's, when you look at this, it just, it just goes deep. And then again, it says, once again, he bent over and began writing on the ground. The people left one by one, beginning with the oldest. Finally, Jesus and the woman were there alone. Beginning with the oldest, I can't think of what you were doing, Maurice, you know, top down. So my question, why did the oldest lead? Obviously, he was the one leading the charge. And then he began to realize something, that there was a warning there for what he was doing. He walked away. And the others followed, didn't they? I think there's a very real reason. And while he was writing on the ground, this is where I go back to that one, where it says, you must impose on the accuser the sentence he intended for the other person. A false witness will not go unpunished. And he who breathes out lies will not escape. That, that sentence there, breathes out lies. What were these scribes and Pharisees doing? Were they not setting up a lie through this secret motive of theirs? This woman would have lost her life. And then Jesus stood up and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? Oh, doesn't that kind of expose what they were up to? Did they go before the priest and the judges? Because if she was accused by the priest and judges, they would have said she's guilty. That didn't happen, did it? I think they were realizing, being a false witness, that they're setting themselves up for an execution. They walked away. And then it said, she said, no, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. I look at that. Those words mean so much to me. Because I came to the conclusion, who was Christ judging? The scribes and Pharisees. He was not judging her. He wasn't. And that's what kind of leads me to the conclusion of thinking, yes, she was set up. She's innocent. Because if she were condemned, she would not be alive. Those scribes and Pharisees. That's why God calls them God's enemies. 
like it said in that example, Psalms 8.2. They were God's enemy. Their motives, setting this woman up so they could get something on Christ, so they can condemn him. They got caught, didn't they? God revealed it. But the most important thing that I want to come back to, because over the years I never questioned that. Someone that they said if they take their life, they're guilty of self-murder and kind of like end of story. I know this man. I know his heart. I know his goodness. And then when I looked away, Christ handled that woman. He says, neither do I. I do not condemn you. But go and sin no more. So I take a future event that I think about in the great right throne judgment as that resurrection occurs. And I think about this man. And would Christ say the same things to him? I don't condemn you. But go and choose life. That's very comforting to me. Because I just, it's a little difficult for me to accept the fact that he's done. Because it's, he took his life. But when I look at this story, it changes my mind completely. Because Christ is a true and righteous God. He looks at the heart. And when it comes to this man, I firmly believe he is going to be looking at the circumstances that drove him to this because his wife, his widow, did reveal to us from childhood he has been dealing with a very severe form of depression, which came, the roots were in criticism from his father that he could not deal with, that the son was not good enough no matter what he did. So he tried hard, but he was trying too many things at one time and he was caught on that treadmill. Yeah, I can't get anything done, but I'm making progress. And what she explained to us was that his medication failed. It was ineffective, it quit. So the doctor tried a new medication that was ineffective. And so it just simply overwhelmed him. And that's what caused him to take his life. And I firmly believe that God, when that jumps at time for him, is going to look at that and see his severe suffering. I don't think he'll condemn him. I think he will simply say, go and choose life. Just as it is for us. He tells us the same. Go and choose life. Thank <laughs> you.